very much indeed for joining us. Um, are you disappointed by the news that, uh, well, certainly from one side, I'm guessing from Hesborough as well, that uh, the prospect for 21 days ceasefire is now not on the cards? Well, early this morning, it looked as if there was the possibility of a 21 day ceasefire, um, <clears throat> building on a um, statement issued by the UN Security Council yesterday, and bearing in mind the General Assembly of the UN is meeting today, and Netanyahu is due to be addressing it, I think, 2.30 our time quite quite shortly. So I think there was there were reasonable grounds for optimism. Mm. Um, 21 days would have given a bit of a pause for, for thinking about what should happen next. And of course, what's happening between Israel and Hezbollah in Lebanon is very much linked to what's happening between Israel and Hamas in Gaza. And of course, standing behind both of those two crises, if you like, is Iran, which itself has its own internal difficulties. Yeah. So these things are quite complex. But since then, um, that optimism has rather paled away. Netanyahu, supported by his foreign minister this morning, has come out quite clearly and said the fighting will continue. Um, and that, I guess, is where we are at the present moment. Yeah, and there's even some talk of possibility of, of a ground invasion, IDF uh, forces uh, have, have suggested. But here's the thing. I mean, Hezbollah is certainly on the back foot at the current time. They've been firing rockets into northern Israel, forcing 60,000 Israelis to be removed from their homes since October the 8th last year in response to that Hamas massacre, long before Israel was uh, uh, was actually mounting attacks on, on, on Gaza in response. Um, we saw those audacious, exploding pages and war talkies we've had the taking out of pretty much everybody involved in the Hezbollah command structure almost to the very top um, uh, in in recent weeks as well we're told by Israeli forces that they may well have taken out something like half of the 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 munitions the the, the long the missiles and, and rockets that that uh, Hezbollah have hidden away among the civilian infrastructure in Lebanon um, there's no doubt at all that you know Israel is on the front foot Hezbollah on the back foot it would be crazy and if we were in that situation it would be crazy for the British army to say yes let's have a ceasefire when we're on the front foot wouldn't it um, put like that yes it would I think but you've got to put it back in the wider context Hezbollah started this conflict um, back on the 7th, 8th of October last year, with an arsenal of probably between 130 and 150,000 rockets and missiles, enough to cover the length and breadth uh, of Israel. And Israel knew that. And Israel has made quite clear previously that if Hezbollah was to kick off in that sort of way, then Israel's retaliation on targets in Lebanon would be profound and possibly also striking targets in Iran. That was the overall background. Now, just connect up some of the things that have happened recently. Yeah. I think that the exploding walkie-talkies and the exploding pages were not just an isolated event. I think this was something that the Israelis had prepared to unleash in concert mm. with deep strikes by their air force uh, and a ground movement by their ground forces. And if they had done those deep and close attack moves uh, at the same time as they had originated their pager and walkie-talkie attacks, that would have had the effect of thoroughly discombobulating Hezbollah's command and control and given the Israelis a chance to move in significantly. Now, I think the page of business went off early because I think Israelis' intelligence told them that their scheme had been rumbled. Yeah. So they themselves got a bit discombobulated, if you like. So where are we now? I think we are with Israel saying it's got a legitimate objective to stop the strikes of Hezbollah into northern Israel from southern Lebanon to get 60,000 people back into their houses for a degree of protection. That's a legitimate thing for them to want to do. Yeah. The big question is, are they going to try and achieve that purely by long range strikes from their air force or are they going to move a division or two into southern Lebanon again? Mm -hmm. Now, given that they've done that twice, um, once staying there for 20 odd years and then withdrawing, then going back in 2006, do they really want to do it again? They yeah. know it'll cost them casualties. So there is a big issues for them to yeah. weigh and, up. And, and indeed fighting, still. Yeah, fighting a, a ground war on two fronts. They're still, of course, in Gaza. I mean, a lot of attention has been taken away from what's happening in Gaza by uh, events in Lebanon in the last few weeks. But that war is still continuing. Those airstrikes are still continuing, the missile attacks back from Hamas fighters. Um, Netanyahu recently extended his war aims, his war goals, not just defeating Hamas, getting the hostages back from Gaza, but also uh, defeating you know, Hezbollah to the extent that um, Israelis can return to their homes in northern uh, Israel. Um, are we any closer to those first two war aims being achieved, though, in Gaza? 
Well, I think, again, you have to see this in the overall background, that both Hamas and Hezbollah, their avowed intent is the destruction and eradication of the state of Israel. So Israel doesn't really feel that it has much option yeah. other than to attack and ideally destroy and eradicate Hamas and Hezbollah. But, of course, it's a little bit like, you know, the post-9-11 trying to wage a war on terror. It's very hard to dislodge movements like Hamas, movements like Hezbollah, which are pretty well embedded in the populations of both Gaza uh, and, and Lebanon. Yeah. So Israel is between a rock and two hard places. Um, it's got to go on fighting for its survival. You're absolutely right that the attention has focused on Hezbollah and Lebanon and taken the focus slightly away from Gaza. But again, I've got to get back to the basic position. Israel is now fighting a war on two fronts. And it's got a relatively modest population. It's got a relatively modest standing army that it's had to call up lots of reservists. The yeah. big question is how long can it sustain this? But yeah. Netanyahu himself is under pressure from his right wing. He's got to show that he's making some, some progress and some success, success and really push this thing to the limit. So I think this morning's optimism of a 21-day ceasefire has eradicated Let's wait and see what Netanyahu says at the General Assembly at 2.30 this afternoon. Yeah, indeed. Um, Under a lot of pressure. Um, um, just finally on that issue, um, on, on the Middle East, um, is the British government and the Western governments generally, are we giving enough support to Israel? We know there's an awful lot of pressure back at home for, under the Labour government, uh, um, pressure on Keir Starmer from you know, backbench Labour MPs, the pro-Palestinian activists, um, I said the, the pro-Hamas activists, as they seem to be every other Saturday on the streets of London. We know the American government under the same uh, pressure as well coming up to a, a presidential election. But is the West giving enough support to Israel, given that they are our democratic ally in the, in the, in the region and they have been under attack and they are simply acting what most reasonable people, I think, would call self-defence well within uh, the, 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 the legalities of war? Well, the UK, along with the US, and of course the US is the major player in this, has traditionally given considerable support to Israel. Um, now, the current UK government has been given some credit for being the first to call for a ceasefire. But um, It's easy to call for a ceasefire, that, though, isn't it? I've just finished my point. Just put this in the wider context. Maybe this is a reduction of the UK's support for Israel. And combine that with the decision to restrict some of the arms exports to Israel. So you could see this as the UK government trying to get out there um, and carry positive world opinion by calling for a ceasefire, but actually it translates into the UK government weakening its support for Israel. Big question, is that the right thing to do or not? Yeah, I, I would say very clearly not, but um, let's talk about support for Ukraine. Uh, President uh, Vladimir Zelensky has been addressing the United Nations as well, along with other world leaders, including Keir Starmer yesterday, um, uh, talking about the, you know, what he needs. We know he's been meeting with uh, not just uh, President Biden, but also the two, the Democrat and Republican candidates, uh, Kamala Harris and uh, Donald Trump. He is desperate to get more aid, more finances, more military might uh, from the West, but particularly from America. Um, do you think there is any likelihood that we will actually see see the US relenting and allowing the British to use the US components that enable our storm shadow missiles to be used by Ukrainian forces to fire into Russian territory? Well, I would certainly hope so. And I've lost track of the number of times publicly I've said that. And yes. my voice is not alone as far as that's concerned. I mean, the whole point is, and it raises a really big question, is the West just doing enough to prevent Ukraine being defeated? Or are we doing enough to help uh, Ukraine get into a position of dominance on the battlefield. Now, 18 months ago, I think one could have argued to say if we give them enough stuff quickly enough, they could perhaps defeat the Russians on the battlefield. I think we've gone beyond that. But we do need, if there are going to be future negotiations at some point, to put the to help the Ukrainians be in a position of strength and of dominance yeah. against the uh, Russian position. So, short answer to your question is yes, we should allow them to use British storm shadow. Um, get back to tech, uh, classic NATO doctrine. We need to help Ukraine win the deep, close and rear battles. And if we don't allow them to use their storm shadow missiles to strike legitimate military targets in Russia, we are making them fight with one arm tied behind their back. If they can't dominate the deep battle space, then, then yeah. they are artificially constrained in the close battle space. And the rear area here 
is actually public opinion, both public opinion at home in Ukraine and world public opinion as well. So we've really got to help Ukraine win the deep, close and rear battles yeah. to get them in a position of dominance um, in its own right, but also to put them in a better position if there should be some negotiations at some point of well, Zelensky's choosing. Well, just it well, well, exactly. It must, yes. Yeah, you don't go through all of this to then say, OK, we're going to give up. But here's the thing I, I, I took from that in the beginning of that answer was about, you know, that, that you don't think that Ukraine can win. They can. You believe that right now Ukraine are no longer going to be capable of ousting Russian forces from, well, in mainland Ukraine, let alone Crimea. Well, let's face it, the Russians have probably got about a half a million men uh, in Ukraine and Cri in eastern Ukraine and Crimea at the present moment. I think mathematically it would be very difficult to destroy them in detail yeah. um, and therefore win on the battlefield in that way. The only way that Ukraine can win on the battlefield is if Putin or someone who follows Putin makes a decision to withdraw from eastern Ukraine and makes a decision to withdraw from Crimea. Otherwise, we are into some kind of um, halfway house, uh, which would characterize a negotiation mm. and some kind of compromised settlement. Now, Zelensky has said, and perfectly understandably, that Eastern Ukraine and Crimea are sovereign Ukrainian territory, and they should be controlled by Ukrainian government. Um, that's quite understandable. Putin, however, needs to consolidate some gains for his own personal reputation uh, in Ukraine. So. Their negotiating positions, as they currently stand, uh, are irreconcilable. Yeah. What is another option? An option is perhaps a negotiated ceasefire, rather like the ceasefire in Korea in 1953. That war was never ended, it just stopped, and there's been no peace agreement on the Korean Peninsula. And it could be that we have some kind of situation like that That's, in Ukraine. Yeah. But that is thoroughly unsatisfactory from a European security point of yeah. view. And probably a rather long way away as well. Lord